Welcome to today's NACDL webcast discussion. I'm Ivan Dominguez, NACDL's Deputy Director of Public Affairs and Communications. As many of you know, in 2008, a jury found the late Senator Ted Stevens of Alaska guilty of false statements on Senate financial disclosure forms, which the prosecution had argued was done to conceal gifts from a man named Bill Allen. Shortly after the guilty verdict was returned, Stevens lost his bid for an eighth term in the United States Senate. Following the verdict, and after a new team of prosecutors were assigned to the case, they found substantial Brady information and promptly disclosed it to the defense. The newly disclosed evidence demonstrated that crucial testimony in the case was fabricated, and the recently appointed Attorney General, Eric Holder, directed prosecutors to file a motion to dismiss the case. Judge Emmett Sullivan ordered an independent investigation into the conduct of the prosecutors in the Stevens case. That investigation led to a 500-plus page report that was released yesterday. NACDL has long championed discovery reform, and yesterday, Senator Murkowski of Alaska, Senator Stevens' colleague, introduced a bipartisan bill in the U.S. Senate entitled the Fairness in Disclosure of Evidence Act of 2012. Today, we have here at NACDL headquarters in Washington, D.C., Ted Stevens' attorney, Robert M. Carey, a partner at Williams & Connolly LLP, and a member of NACDL's White Collar Crime Committee. We also have Norman Reamer, executive director of NACDL and a criminal defense practitioner for nearly 30 years. As you can see on the screen, to the right of the window in which you're watching this webcast, there is a chat tab. Please feel free to submit any questions that you have during the course of this webcast. Norman? Thank you very much, Ivan, and I want to welcome our viewers to NACDL headquarters here in Washington, D.C., and this opportunity to, dis to discuss the wrongful prosecution of the late Senator Ted Stevens, the remedial legislation that was introduced yesterday and supported by a bipartisan group of senators, and some larger issues about our criminal justice system. As Ivan mentioned, we're fortunate to be joined by Rob Carey. Uh, Rob and his colleagues at Williams and Connolly provided the kind of heroic representation that make all of us associated with NACDL proud to consider ourselves Liberty's last champions. Let me begin with a broad overview of how we plan to proceed during our time together. Uh, we'll spend some time discussing the specific misconduct in the Stevens case. Then we're going to talk about S-2197, the Fairness in Disclosure of Evidence Act of 2012 that was introduced yesterday and why it will contribute and we'll discuss why it will and how it will contribute to the cause of justice in this country. During the course of the broadcast, uh, which uh, for those of you who may be tuning in and tuning out is, will be available for later viewing. Uh, as Ivan Dominguez mentioned, um, we invite you to submit questions and Ivan uh, will just simply uh, let us know and, and pass them along to us. Um, Rob, welcome to NACDL. Thanks, Mark. Um, before we turn to the substance, uh, all of us as defense lawyers know that the most important thing for us is the welfare of our clients. Uh, tragically, Senator Stevens died in a plane crash after the dismissal of the charges, but well before this report was, was issued. Let me begin by asking you, how is Senator Stevens' family doing? Uh, thank you for asking, because that's uh, largely what this is about. Uh, they are uh, stunned by what they've read. They didn't get to read it until the public did just yesterday. They're uh, saddened. They find it hard to believe, hard to accept that, that prosecutors in the United States government uh, Ted Stevens served for so many years would do what they did to him. Well, of course, we want to convey our best wishes to them and uh, hope that they will uh, at long last come to a, a, some point of healing. Let's talk Thank, about thanks. the report now. And, um, and why don't you give us a little bit of background? First of all, how did the, how did the report, uh, who, who, how was it conducted, who, was it, who conducted it, and how was it set up? Yeah. On, on April 7, 2009, the day the case was dismissed by Judge Sullivan after there was an initial disclosure of, uh, of Brady information that caused the Attorney General to order the case be dismissed. Uh, the, uh, the judge, Judge Sullivan, ordered uh, an independent counsel investigation uh, to determine whether criminal contempt proceedings were appropriate, as he can do under the federal rules of criminal procedure. Uh, he appointed Hank Schulke, a uh, prominent Washington defense lawyer and former prosecutor himself. Uh, he was a federal prosecutor. He was a federal prosecutor for many years and a real uh, lion of the bar here in Washington, D.C. 
uh, to conduct an investigation which has taken place over the past couple of years. Now, I understand it, it, it not only took two years, but there's some, uh, they looked at some 128,000 pages of documents. Uh, do you know what they looked at exactly? Well, sure. Um, I, not all those documents have, have been made available, but according to the report, they looked at, at 302s, interview notes, uh, uh, emails. It was an email that was turned over by the prosecutors that actually broke open the, the, the Brady information that, that caused the case to be dismissed. And uh, they took depositions and, and, and testimony of witnesses as well. So it's quite a thorough investigation. A, a very thorough, uh, uh, monumental investigation. Now, uh, among the conclusions uh, that I observed in there was that they found that the prosecution was uh, riddled with corruption uh, and that there was a win-at-all-cost mentality. All, all true and something, uh, something I observed. But they didn't find any, uh, any actual wrongdoing. And, and, and as I understand it, the judge had appointed uh, uh, Mr. Schulke and his team to see whether or not there had been any contempt. Is that yeah. right? So let, let me uh, correct you. Just so I, I believe they did find wrongdoing, but they did not find criminal contempt. And the reason, the reason for that is that uh, criminal contempt requires an uh, intentional violation of a clear and unambiguous order. And uh, Mr. Schulke found that in fact, there was no clear and unambiguous order issued by Senator uh, by, by Judge uh, Su uh, Sullivan to produce Brady information. Why did he Why did he not issue such an order? Because Judge Sullivan very fairly and rightly assumed that the, the prosecutors would follow the law. Right. So, um, uh, for those of you who, you know who are, have uh, who are viewing this, you can see that we've we put up some of the language uh, from the report, uh, which in, which in fact uh, found. Uh, that there was no evidence that would establish beyond a reasonable doubt that anyone or more of the prosecutors, in fact, uh, recalled the information and concealed it from uh, the law firm. Um, but uh, as you correctly pointed out, uh, the report did find misconduct. It found systemic violations of, of the Brady uh, rules. It found a, uh, uh, that, that, uh, a failure to disclose uh, important material information permeated the case, and it found in some cases, Norm, that that was intentional. Right. Um, so it, let me stay with this one point, though, in terms of uh, uh, why there was no contempt. Um, had there been any order issued by Judge Sullivan uh, regarding Brady material? Well, the, the, we, we had many discussions in court where uh, as, as you might imagine, and as we often do, we were pushing and pushing and pushing for Brady information. We were told many times that there was no Brady information or that everything had been produced. We know our responsibilities. And uh, there were many discussions about Brady, and there were many times where Judge Sullivan said, well, I'm not going to issue an order because everybody knows the law and they're going to follow the law. So, um, but, but Mr. Schulke found that in the end there was no clear, unambiguous order that thou shalt comply with Brady. It was more the judge accepted the representations right, right. That, that they would, in fact, follow the law. And indeed, this is uh, what we're showing uh, the viewers now is from page 31 of the report where uh, the judge said, you know what, I'm not going to write an order that says follow the law. Uh, and so there never was an actual order. Um, now, that's fairly typical, isn't it, in criminal, in uh, federal criminal yes, prosecutions? Yes, of, of, course, of course it is. It's actually rare when an order is actually entered. And look, let's let's face it, uh, prosecutors are officers of the court, they ought to be able to give a representation, they ought to be able to rely upon it. The, the, the problem is that there's no transparency to the process. And the, the, the answer I get over and over and over again, and I'm sure you got when you were practicing, was we understand our obligations and we'll comply with it. It's almost as if there's a special form letter at the Department of Justice where they print that out. Right. And that's the answer right. to all your Brady inquiries. You don't get your questions answered, you're just told, we. Trust us, we'll produce it if we have to. Now, we have uh, some 90-some districts in this country, right? Right. And, and do they all have the same standards, or are there different standards? Well, uh, you know, as part of the um, Ogden memoranda that, that, that were issued, uh, the Attorney General directed, maybe the Associate Deputy Attorney General directed, that um, each office establish new policies for complying with Brady. And uh, I'm told that they've done that, but they haven't been produced to produced to the uh, to, to the public yet we don't know we don't know what they are and in fact uh, it's my understanding and I think the Ogden memorandum recognizes that there are different practices in different jurisdictions different judges have different approaches different local rules have different approaches and so 
uh, there isn't there is not a uniform approach. Am I correct also that the uh, that the memoranda issued by the uh, Deputy Attorney General, uh, Mr. Ogden, uh, are not um, uh, documents upon which the defense can rely in order to compel disclosure? They they make very clear that they should not be relied on by anybody. Uh, they, they're praised by the Department of Justice as 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 the guidelines that they follow, but they're just that the they're, they're just guidelines, and more often than not, um, in fact. I'm not sure I've ever been able to enforce the guidelines in so, court. So they're guidelines. The accused and their lawyers can't rely upon them, and each district can uh, enforce them as they deem appropriate. Is that fair? Yes. To say? Although I'm, I, I, I've, I've never seen a, a, a court in all my experience enforce the guidelines. Well, let's turn now to the specific violations in this case, uh, and let's talk about that for a bit. Uh, basically, the report identifies three classes of misconduct, but but each and every one of them was a separate kind of violation of Brady. So the first one uh, uh, really deals with a recently fabricated testimony and an attempt to hide the evidence of the recent lie from the defense. Um, this, I understand, involves a, a, a note that was written by uh, Senator Stevens long before the prosecution. Why don't you tell us about that? Right. So uh, we called it the most important piece of evidence in the case. It was a note from Senator Stevens. It read, Dear Bill, when I think of the many ways in which you make my life easier and more enjoyable, I lose count. Thanks for all the work on the chalet. You owe me a bill. Remember Tori Chile, my friend. Friendship is one thing. Compliance with these ethics rules is entirely different. I asked Bob Persons to talk to you about this, so don't get PO'd at him. It just has to be done right. The background of this is that uh, Senator Stevens was having renovations done on a house, a, a chalet, a very modest cabin in Alaska. He spent $160,000 on those renovations. Um, Bill Allen and Bob Persons were friends who were looking after the renovations while he was in, in Alaska. In fact, the value of those renovations was much less than $160,000. The senator paid every bill that was presented to him. And this note we thought was so important because when there was a little work that was done that he hadn't asked for and, 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 and did not, he hadn't even seen it at this point, he writes a note to make sure it's done right. We argue that it was a snapshot into the mind of an innocent man. Um, well, let me, let, me, yeah. let, me, let me break this down a little bit so that uh, our viewers can, can, can get the sequence of events. This, the investigation and the indictment, uh, well, the indictment came in 2008, is that correct? Correct. This letter was written in October of 2002. Yes. So it was years before he was, there was any investigation. Many years beforehand, yes. The bill is Bill Allen, who was the star witness, right? Correct. That was the government's cooperating witness, the one that uh, their case relied upon. So he was specifically asking for a bill. And, and why don't you explain what the reference to Torricelli is? So uh, just about that time in 2002, Senator Robert Torricelli from New Jersey had just decided not to run for office again because of ethics issues. And, and Ted Stevens was saying, remember Torricelli. We want to make sure we do this right. Uh, uh, compliance with the ethics rules is important. It just has to be done right. And just so it's clear, the, the government didn't get this letter from Bill Allen, right? They got this letter uh, produced by us voluntarily, even though we didn't have to because the senator wanted to produce all the documents uh, well in advance of an indictment on April 11, 2008. Okay. So what was what was the uh, the lie that? that Bill Allen told in the testimony at the trial. So fast forward to the trial. Um, we highlighted this in our, our opening. My partner, Brennan Sullivan, says this note grabs you by the throat and shows you what the intent of, of Bill Allen was. As, as, as lawyers, we know you can't, there's no such thing as a mind reader, but we show the intent of people by looking at documents and, 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 and the, the circumstances of how things are happening. So that was very important to us. The lie from <coughs> Bill Allen was right before a break, in a morning break, you could almost see the, the, the prosecutor killing a little bit of time so he could ask the question at just the right time. He asked Bill Allen about this note. And uh, Bill Allen says, I don't know if you have that, that testimony available. We're going we're gonna to bring that up. He says, um, that's the second note. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I have it almost memorized. Yeah, he said, go uh, I got the note, and he said, don't worry about it, Bill. Uh, Ted's just trying to cover his ass. And that, just at that moment, it was time for the morning break. The government had timed it exactly perfectly. I should add that uh, that came in as an exception to the uh, hearsay exception under the uh, co-conspirator hearsay rule. And uh, that- Because P Persons was identified as a, as a, as a co-conspirator. 
uh, actually is a joint, the law is a little worse in the District of Columbia, is a, is a joint venture, not an unindicted co-conspirator, but yes, is a, is a joint venture. And uh, that became the theme of the government's case, that this was a case, but even as far back as 2002, Ted Stevens wasn't trying to do things right, he was just trying to cover his ass. Uh, they took the heart of our defense, and they turn it into the heart of their case against him. So let me let me just uh, again let me get the the sequence right. You turned over the letter, and and by the way, there was a second letter which we just put up there, right from November right. of, of uh, a month later, from November of 2002, uh, where he where the senator reminds Bill again, uh, don't forget about the bill. Right. And you turned that over in April. Correct. Uh, and this disclosure, this 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 the cover your ass statement comes out, you know, during uh, during the trial, right? Yes. How Complete many, surprise to us. How many times had, had Bill Allen been interviewed by uh, FBI and prosecutors? Over 50 times that were documented by 302s. Now, one thing we may get into if we have time is that there were many, many interviews of Bill Allen, including the most important one I think we're going to get to that was not documented or not documented with a 302, which FBI rules require. But uh, over, over 50 times, he never said it before. And that came as a complete now, shock. Now, yes. I, I know from reading the report that, in fact, he was asked specifically about the conversation, and he denied any recollection of having that conversation so, with persons, so right? So this is the key. This is what we learned much later that caused the Attorney General to dismiss the case that we did not do, know during the trial. Uh, I told you we produced it on April 11th, mm -hmm. 2008. On April 15th, 2008, they interviewed Bill Allen, and they asked him about this. And the report details the concern among the prosecution team about this note. I think uh, the FBI agent even suggested it might be fatal to the case. Uh, there's uh, some um, suspicion raised. They even look into whether it was a forged note. They didn't believe it was authentic because they were so concerned about it. So they went down this road of trying to prove that it wasn't, in fact, authentic. And what they did is they, they, they asked Bill Allen about it, and he said, I remember getting the note, but I don't remember uh, any conversations with Bob Persons about the bill. 180 degrees opposite of what he testified and, but to. But you never trial. had any reports to that effect. Not not until five months after the trial. Okay. So uh, naturally, uh, this is a big problem for the defense when he testifies to this on direct examination. Right? Yes, it was terrible, terrible, terrible for the defense. The, the, the uh, his his examination was handled by your partner. Is that correct? Correct, Brendan Sullivan. So let's take a look at what happened. Uh, this is from the actual uh, cross examination uh, by Brendan Sullivan, right? So, Norm, we, we suspected and believed immediately, not suspected, we believed absolutely it was, a, it was a complete lie, a recent fabrication. Brendan gets up on cross-examination and asks him about it, and he says, when did you first tell the government that persons told you Ted was covering his ass and these notes were meaningless? It was just recently, wasn't it? And Bill Allen said, no, no, he denied it. And then? You gave them reasons why you didn't send a bill. You answered you simply wanted to do the work was one of them, and another was part of the reason was that the costs were higher than they needed to be. These are things that we knew about. You didn't tell them about persons' conversations with you, did you? Answer, you know what? I don't know when I talked to them, but I did talk to him, and it's been quite a back, quite a while back, whether you like it or not, whether you like it or you don't. And then there's one more. When did you first come up with this, sir? When, when did I come up with it? Question, when did you first tell somebody Answer, huh? Question, when did you first tell a government agent? Answer, hell, I don't know. I don't know what day it was. Uh, so let me ask you this question. Uh, the prosecutor is sitting there. He knows that, uh, presumably, he knows that there's been an interview where he has previously said he had no recollection of it. Is there some duty under uh, that a prosecutor would have in that circumstance? Yeah, so there's probably one more thing that we ought to fill in. We now know from the report. We didn't know at the time. We we, we knew it was recent. We didn't know when. It was September 14th, 2008, eight days before the trial started, that he came up with this miraculous mm -hmm. testimony for the first time that Ted Stevens was just covering his ass. Uh, the prosecutor sat there, listened to that testimony, says, oh, no, it wasn't recent. Uh, I don't know when it was. It was quite a while back. Told, told all these things, and he, he did not correct it. And under Napu versus Illinois, uh, we, we lawyers know that, that, that uh, the government can't stand by silently while false testimony is presented to the jury. So in, con in conducting the investigation, uh, Mr. Schulke and his team obviously reached out to all of the various participants, including the prosecutors. And I I'd actually like to have your reaction uh, to this. This is from an addendum which was a submission on behalf of the, the prosecutor who uh, was who had put uh, Mr. Allen on the stand and who was sitting there in the courtroom. Uh, and he said, 
um, the attorneys on behalf of, of the prosecutor said to suggest that Mr. Bettini, who was the prosecutor, should have stood up and informed the court that Mr. Allen first recounted this recollection to the government on September uh, 14th, 2008, uh, or September 4th, rather, 2008, is to advance an interpretation of Napway that is fundamentally incorrect. You agree with that? I cannot possibly square that, uh, square my reading of Napway with, with, with the uh, testimony that we just saw up there. Well, well, giving all the benefit of the doubt, which as defense lawyers we like to do in almost every situation, mm -hmm. Is, is, is part of the problem that we have with Brady that it is, uh, that the way things stand right now, that it's subjective? Well, here's, here's the problem. The, the, the Supreme Court has said quite clearly that in order to have a Brady violation, the information that was withheld has to be material. And it's, the term material is the key here because as a defense lawyer, I think material means anything that's going to be favorable to me probably. Uh, uh, that, that certainly is one interpretation. And, and uh, one of our trial judges here in the District of Columbia, Judge Friedman, has written an opinion that that's what it means right. at the trial right. level. Uh, prosecutors take a very different tack. They say material means, well, it'd be a game changer in the case, or uh, it means that uh, if you have this information, then they're, then they're not guilty, in which case they shouldn't have brought the indictment in the first place. Th there's Prosecutors seem to have a lot of different definitions of materiality, but, but, and that, that's, that's the problem. But here we have a situation where a witness, for the first time on the eve of trial, comes up with this tremendously damaging statement after he's already said he had no recollection of any such conversation about, you know, we had, it's just Ted trying to cover his ass. And the prosecutor is asserting that that's not something that would be material. I, I, I can't imagine in my wildest dreams that that is not material, but the problem is that Brady happens in a black box. It happens inside the prosecutor's head. It happens in the office. We can't, we defense lawyers can't see through walls. We have no way to testify, to, to test the bona fides of, of the positions that the government's taken. They make the decisions themselves, and you have problems like this when they do. So let's, uh, let's close the loop on this first prong of the violations, and uh, uh, so not only uh, did your partner uh, uh, have to live with the answer that he got in which the witness essentially uh, denied that he had recently made it up, um, but uh, it actually uh, was relied upon by them in the summation, was it not? It became uh, the theme of their case. Um, it became the theme of the cross-examination of Senator Stevens and uh, something that they, they both relied on in their closing. and, and and in their uh, and in their rebuttal. And this is the uh, the slide that we have put up there now is actually he said, taken right out of the trial transcript. It is the summation by the prosecutor. He's covering his ass, and uh, that uh, that was that was the government's theme that this was some sort of uh, scheme from the beginning to, to, to cover one's ass. And uh, and and the, and the last point on on this prong, this is the finding of the report with respect to this uh, the concealment of this recent fabrication. Uh, and uh, our viewers can see that the Schulke report uh, concluded that the complete, simultaneous, and long-term memory failure by the entire prosecution team, four prosecutors and the FBI case agent, of the same statement about an important document made at the same meeting by their key witness in a high-profile case is extraordinary. And considering the galvanizing effect the Torricelli notes had on the prosecutors during the weeks following its receipt, that memory failure becomes astonishing. That was so, the word. so let me uh, just explain that just a little bit. There were four people who took notes at that meeting where Bill Allen said that he didn't remember talking to Bob Persons on April 15, 2008. Uh, each of those people claimed that they didn't remember the conversation, even though it was considered very important to them at the time. It was very important as the trial approached that they come up with some sort of explanation for the note, and that's Mr. Schulke's conclusion about their lack of recollection of that conversation. So let's turn to the second uh, core violation now, and you've already alluded to this. Um, there was false evidence regarding the value of the home renovation, and uh, there was a hiding uh, of the information from the defense that would prove uh, that the value claim was in fact a lie. Why don't you tell us 
Uh, well, I think you mentioned, what did the Stevens pay for this? So the Stevens paid over $160,000 for the renovations. And what was it assessed at by independent the, the, assessors? The uh, assessor, the tax assessor, uh, assessed the value at $105,000. The appraiser for the bank that issued the loan said they should cost $124,000. So from the Stevens perspective, they paid more than they were worth. But what did the government claim it was worth at the trial? The government claimed they were worth $250,000 or over $250,000. So if they were right, then the senator misrepresented the value. If they were right and, and, and he knew that they were worth that amount of money, uh, that would be correct, yes. Well, what did they rely on to try to establish they, that? They relied on billing records uh, from uh, this company, Vico, that Bill Allen owned. And um, they put these in as business records, as you know you can do mm -hmm. under the business record exception. If it's kept in the ordinary course of business and it rolls into evidence, presumably reliable under the, under the law. And, and was there some evidence eventually that undercut the accuracy of those records? Uh, the, the, there was. Uh, one of the people, workers on the bill was a person by the name of Rocky Williams who uh, called us, um, he was actually in Washington being prepared by the government to testify. They sent him back to, uh, back to Alaska even though he was under a defense subpoena. Was that during the trial? That was uh, literally on the day of opening statements. On the day of opening statements, a witness that was under subpoena by the defense Correct. was sent back to Alaska. Correct. When he got back to Alaska, he called us, and, uh, and he, he, did, he did have some health issues. Although the last time I checked, we had pretty good hospitals here in Washington, D.C. that probably could have taken care of his health issues. But uh, he told us <laughs> yeah. that the records reflected that he was working full-time on the job, and in fact, he wasn't working nearly full-time on the job, and that he told the government that. So that, therefore, the actual cost would have been far less than what the government was Correct. claiming. Correct. And that was news to us. There was another worker who wasn't even in the state of Alaska, we later learned, when, as these failures of disclosure started to unravel, we got more and more information. We found that another worker who had huge amounts of time wasn't even in the state of Alaska when he was supposedly working on the renovation. So, so when did this information come out? In the middle of trial. And, and let me just add, that is a terribly, terribly difficult position to be in as a trial lawyer. To, you know, we, we try to plan our trials in advance, knowing what the evidence is. Yeah. And when thing is, things are just sprung on you, it makes it very difficult. You can't turn, yeah. turn the ship on a dime. Uh, well, uh, not only does it make it difficult to investigate, but it, it really turns the trial into a test of a, of a, of a defense attorney's uh, wit, and uh, their wits and their ability to think on their feet and, of course. Uh, and react without having any opportunity to prepare. Correct, yes. Well, let me now turn to the third violation, because this one, in, in, in some respects, is, 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 is actually uh, almost the most outrageous, although it may not have been from the evidentiary standpoint on the substantive part of the case. Um, but the government, according to the report, hid evidence that Bill Allen was a sexual predator and had suborned perjury previously to protect himself. That's, that's correct. There was a 15-year-old um, woman in connection with another case who told the FBI, according to a FBI 302, an interview, uh, FBI interview memo form, that uh, Bill Allen had asked her to submit a, f a false affidavit denying that she had had sex with him when she was underage, when in fact she had. That was hidden from us. It was a fundamental part of the case that, w uh, that, that we thought we, we should be able to go into. And the government hid that from us, and they made misrepresentations that no such evidence of that existed. And so uh, you never actually knew about that during the case? No, we did not know about that affidavit. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, we did not know about that 302. I should say it was produced in a mass of other documents near the very end of the trial at, 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 at a time where it wasn't uh, possible to, to digest it and understand it. But they had suggested to you that there was, that there was no evidence uh, to support the allegation that he had asked the woman to make a false they, statement, they, isn't that right? They sent us a letter and they stood up in court and said that, yes. So that was, uh, uh, that was a, uh, something that directly went to his credibility, right? Absolutely, yes. And, and credibility is, is, is that's part of what a, uh, what's considered favorable under the Brady Doctrine. Uh, right? of, of course. Uh, look, we know as lawyers that our cases turn on the credibility of witnesses. That's, that's, that's what it often boils down to, especially especially when it's intent that's at issue. Now, why don't you uh, describe the connection between the possibility of these state charges uh, and the timing of the cover, cover so, his ass statement? There is a, um, in addition to this, the, the, the woman who the 302 related to, there was another state investigation into whether he engaged in sex, uh, 
we learned this from the report really for the first time. There was another investigation that was uh, taking place at the state level over whether um, he had engaged in, in sexual activity with minors. Uh, Bill Allen, the uh, expert, and or I'm sorry, the, the government's witness. And um, that was reaching a fevered pitch as we were getting ready for trial. Uh, the government, the federal government, an FBI agent, according to the report, I'm learning this for the first time, uh, learned that the investigation had merit and that they told Bill Allen, or actually they told Bill Allen's lawyer about the investigation, mm -hmm. and Allen was told, uh, told that there was a state investigation. It's the perfect Petri dish in which to fabricate a lie because he's obviously very concerned about his exposure in this, uh, this other investigation. The pressure is building and building and building, uh, and they keep asking him about trying to figure out how to explain right. the senator's own letter saying, make sure you send me a bill. Right, and that's, 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 it's out of that environment that the, the lie grows. So if we were to summarize, uh, and of course it's, uh, for those of you who are lawyers and watching this, I, I urge you to read the, the entire report, uh, which is really quite something. Um, but to, uh, for the purposes of a broad summary, you actually had um, virtually every aspect of what is generally considered favorable uh, was present in this case and not, and not turned over. You had recent fabrication. You had favorable substantive evidence regarding the, the value of the, of, the, of the renovations. And then you have the impeachment of the, of the character and, and, and truthfulness of, of, the, of the key witness. That's correct. And, and in all three instances, uh, you were deprived of the information that you would have needed. That's absolutely right. So, yesterday, uh, Senator Murkowski, uh, a colleague uh, of Senator Stevens from Alaska, uh, introduced the Fairness in Disclosure of Evidence Act of 2012, uh, which would create a new section of the code, 18 U.S.C. Uh, 3014. Um, what are some of the key provisions of this law? One of the key provisions is that it uh, provides for a uh, uniform definition of what is favorable evidence. So. We were talking before about how the prosecutor is the sole arbiter of whether it's material or not, and how, how, how that can sometimes be subjective. And, and under this proposed legislation, or under this bill, uh, all favorable evidence would, is, is clearly defined and would have to be turned over to the defense. So uh, for, for once and for all, we would get beyond this sort of subjective district-by-district uh, district interpretation. Yes. Um, that's, that's absolutely correct. And now, what does it provide for when it would be turned over? In fact, I would say it's a prosecutor-by-prosecutor prosecutor determination in some ways, and, and there's no way to test it. That's the problem. When would it have to be turned over? As soon as practicable after, after discovery. And, and a, a case, um, really the government ought to be ready to turn it over at, at arraignment, but, but there is some, uh, uh, some flexibility built into and, this proposed and, legislation. And what, is it, uh, how, what would the law provide in terms of remedies? I would provide discretion for the, the, the judge to impose a variety of remedies. One, one of the issues we ran into in the Stevens case is that uh, Judge Sullivan uh, tries he might to give us a fair trial, had very little case law to rely on, on what to do when something is happening in the middle of, of, uh, of trial and what the remedies are. This has a, has a list of remedies that ranges from uh, a continuance, uh, uh, mistrial, start, uh, dismiss the case with or without prejudice, uh, you know, it's a, it's a range of, of remedies and gives the judge discretion, depending upon how serious it is, to, to impose a, a, a remedy that's appropriate for the circumstance. So, in other words, uh, if, it, if it's a, 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 let's say you have a witness who's got some favorable information and, the, and, and, it, and it comes to light uh, sometime before the trial, but it's maybe getting close to the trial, uh, the judge could simply give the defense an opportunity to find the witness, interview the witness. Is that right? Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, but if later on there may be some some more uh, some additional remedies. Yes, for for and 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 under some circumstances, if appropriate findings are made, fees might 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 be appropriate. And you know, if you think about that, that's only fair if somebody gears up for a trial, spends what for for most citizens, if they're paying for their own mm -hmm. lawyer, is the, the the greatest expense they're ever going to have in their life, other than buying a home. And you get three quarters of the way through trial, and then, oh, there's a Brady problem, and you got to start over. That's not that, that's not fair. There ought to be some remedy for that. And to be fair, in terms of the uh, a determination that the uh, government would have to bear the cost of the fees, 
uh, even though it may seem like it's one pocket paying the other, it also provides that this would be, there would be, um, that fees could be reimbursed for federal defenders and for, uh, and for uh, uh, assigned attorneys as well. Is that Correct. right? Correct, which, which I think would, would the, the fact that that's there is going to make it more likely that we're going to have justice in America, that, 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 that disclosures are going to take place. There has to be some consequence for the sorts of failures that, that, uh, that, that we've seen in this case and other cases. Now, let me, let me ask you also one other aspect of the law. What, what, what does it do with regard to the standard if, if, a, if a violation has occurred, it comes to light, too late to do anything about it at trial, and now the case is on appeal? What's the, what kind of a standard would this law apply? Uh, the, the, the standard is the uh, beyond a reasonable doubt stand, constitutional standard for a constitutional violation that uh, applies whenever there is a, a constitutional error in a case. And, and the Supreme Court has said basically that, the, uh, that it is a constitutional, uh, Brady establishes this as a constitutional. It arises from the right. Fifth Amendment, of course, yes. So I want to get into a discussion with you uh, uh, about why the law is necessary. And, and I want to ask you a, what I think is a, a kind of a tough question, uh, but, but I think it needs to be answered. Um, some will say, um, well, you know, there was a Brady violation in, this, in, in the Stevens case. There's no question that it was a violation of Brady, at least in, 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 the, in the eyes of the, the court, in the eyes of the Attorney General, uh, and in the, in the eyes of the, Mr. Schulke. So why would this law help? Why do we need this law? I think, um, uh, first of all, I agree with you completely that they, under anybody's definition of materiality, they violated it. But, but the Stevens case also shows time and time again when they came in with the false records, they said, oh, it doesn't really matter because there's so much time on here that, that it wouldn't make a difference in the case it wasn't material. In, um, in um, the responses of some of the prosecutors, they are arguing to this day, notwithstanding the fact that you agree court agreed, uh, Mr. Uh, Schulke agreed, apparently the Attorney General agreed that it was material. Uh, a number of these prosecutors are arguing to this day, oh, it wouldn't have made any difference, it's, 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 it's not material. Well, we saw that with the, uh, with the statement submitted on behalf of Mr. Bettini. Uh, yes, that's, ex that's exactly right. That's, he, to this day, he's arguing that a lot of this information was not material. Um, you know, although there were, Mr. Schulke found there wasn't an order in the end, it was very clear that Judge Sullivan wanted all favorable information produced in this case, and really it was the production of the favorable information that led to the House of Cards collapsing mm -hmm. and uh, led to information that anybody would have to say is material. You know, um, I, I was on a panel at the Seventh Circuit Judicial Conference with uh, uh, Locke Bowman, who runs the wrongful, or he's involved in the wrongful convictions yeah. uh, project at, at, at Northwestern University, and he said that um, you, you need, he's seen so many wrongful convictions, and he says that there are two common denominators to getting the information you need out of the government. One is uh, fierce advocacy, and the other is you have to eliminate a, uh, any excuse for non-disclosure. You have to, uh, you have to um, make it clear what has to be disclosed, and, and, and I, I, uh, I think this legislation does that. So essentially it's an, it's an attempt to change the culture and create a mentality of, of compliance with this basic notion yes. of fairness. Yes, and, and let me say this. I, I, you know, I, I actually, you know, some members of the Defense Department may disagree with this. I actually think the Justice Department has tried very hard to change, change their culture. But we don't know. They've tried this before. They, they, they amended the U.S. Attorney's Manual in 2006. And, you know, that was good for a while, but there, need to be, there needs to be a clear rule that all favorable information needs to go to the defense, one that's going to survive to the next attorney general and the attorney general after that and the attorney general that. I don't think it's enough is, just for, for, for this Justice Department to say, well, we, we now think we fixed the problem. Is it fair to say that this kind of legislation would actually help the honorable, conscientious prosecutors in this country, help them in, in preparing their cases, help them in dealing with their own agents and, 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 and when they're taking notes or should be taking notes of interviews? I, I, of course it would. I, I think it would. And we'll, we'll all benefit if things are done, done fairly and if the, the information comes out and we have the, the, the truth. I, and I've been told by some prosecutors who support open file discovery or, or liberal discovery that it actually helps them in, in appropriate cases. They get more pleased that way. It, the, the game shouldn't be a game of ambush. It shouldn't be a game of gotcha. And this, 
goes a long way towards eliminating that. Well, well let's talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the standard arguments uh, in opposition to reform. Um, and let's think in terms of how this, this legislation has been crafted. Um, what about the issue of witness safety? Supposing the government really has a concern uh, that, gee, if we disclose too much information, the witness will be jeopardized. I acknowledge that. It doesn't happen in my cases very often, but I certainly acknowledge it can happen. And this legislation very thoughtfully provides mechanisms for protective orders, ex parte uh, communications in certain instances with the court. If there is a legitimate issue of witness safety, uh, that can be dealt with with a delayed a delayed disclosure or some sort of ex parte, uh, ex parte communication. That's built into this legislation. And I, and I gather the, uh, the fact that the legislation uh, provides for a filing under seal would also uh, provide an opportunity for a prosecutor who maybe isn't all that sure if it is favorable but, but wants to make sure that the, the, uh, the, the rights of the accused are protected to submit it to the court for the court's evaluation. Right, which is one of the things that Judge Sullivan said on the uh, many times during the cases that the judges need to be involved in this and uh, it does uh, it does provide for that now now especially in this day and age um, we frequently hear concerns about national security uh, what about a uh, uh, does the fairness and disclosure uh, uh, of evidence act uh, take into account concerns about national security it, it does it expressly in, uh, incorporates the, the classified information protection act and provides the procedures that are in place today and make sure that those will stay in place in order to uh, address issues of national security. So if a prosecutor thinks that there may be something going on here that involves classified information, they can go right to the, to the Classified Information Act uh, and, and, get the, and, and involve the court uh, through that and, mechanism. And invoke, invoke those uh, uh, procedures which attempt to balance fairness, fairness to the uh, defense and make sure, making sure that the defense gets a fair trial with issues of national security. That, that law is in place now and this does nothing to change it. What about judicial discretion? Does this, uh, does it, will it restrict judicial discretion or, or will it, it enhance it? It's carefully, uh, carefully <clears throat> um, crafted to uh, try to preserve judicial discretion. Uh, but, but, but at the same time giving guidance to the court where, where, where it's needed. I guess that gets back to the point that you made before that about the incremental remedies that the court can, uh, can assess. Yes. So it really is up to the judge to look at the, the uh, appropriate facts and circumstances and then fashion the remedy that, that fits the situation. Correct. Uh, there's another one I want to ask you about. Um, is there any risk of over-disclosure? Is there any chance that this is going to require prosecutors to turn over uh, uh, more uh, information uh, than it, uh, is necessary? If it's favorable to the defense, it ought to go to the defense and uh, many I, I don't see where that I don't see where that's an issue. Now, um, th there's also um, a concern: uh, is, is, it, is this going to force them to go on fishing expeditions into other agencies' files? Well, once again, it's carefully crafted, uh, very thoughtful legislation that um, provides a, a, a reasonable due diligence standard for when you need to go to other agencies' files. There are, there are cases, and I've I've had cases where agencies are cooperating hand in hand, arm in arm, and, and, and of course in those cases you, they, they'd be required to go look or if they had reason to think that, that it ought to be there, but no, they don't have to go through, uh, through, a, through a fishing expedition. One last one, what about the timeliness of disclosure? Is that over, is there, does it create a, a, anything that could be perceived as an undue burden on the prosecution? What well, shouldn't, the, the government, <clears throat> look, one of the things that we were told, it, it's in the report, it's not one of the featured things in the report, is that uh, the, the prosecutors told us on, day, on the day of arraignment that they were just about ready to produce all their discovery. In fact, uh, they weren't anywhere close. When, when you indict a case, you ought to be ready to produce your discovery. <coughs> Citizens have speedy trial rights. That uh, They ought to be ready to go to trial quickly. So no, I don't, th I don't think it's unreasonable at all to, uh, to uh, require it to be produced when, when, when it's practicable, which is what the, which is what the statute the proposed statute would require. So uh, let me shift back to the, to the larger picture here now. And um, uh, having lived through this, uh, this case for all these years, uh, the, the two years of this investigation by, uh, by Schulke, um, and having had a chance, well, you obviously as, as attorneys in the case, you, you've had an opportunity before it was publicly unsealed. Right. Um, is there anything uh, uh, in this report that, that surprised you? 
Oh yes, I, I, I mean, first of all, there was new information. I think one that we didn't count on was this same gentleman, Rocky Williams, uh, believed that all of his time was billed, was billed to the Stevenses, right. and yeah. and the, the the we didn't even talk about that one, but the the. The prosecutors mocked the senator, and they mocked Mrs. Stevens for suggesting that was their belief too. And they they um, asked him about it. It's in some notes, but then the 302 that was prepared by the FBI agent doesn't include that very helpful piece of information. But that was a, a, a would have been a game changer for us. That that was a surprise. Um, the. Um, I mean, you know, it depends on what you mean by surprise. After that, I mean, there were always nothing ceases to shock me, nothing and surprise you, me in this case. But, but except that there are going to be more surprises, and there's more hidden evidence. And and Mr. Shulky and and his colleague Mr. Shields did a great, great job of of trying to get to the bottom of this. I don't. You know, once again, we weren't there. We don't see through walls. We know what it felt like. We know the conclusions that we were reached. We know the falsehoods that were 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 told to the court for one reason or another, Mr. Shulky says in some cases con right. intentional, in some cases not. But um, <clears throat> yeah, and the answer is yes, I was, I was surprised with the caveat that nothing would surprise me at this point. You know, one of the things that, that struck me as I was reading it is that it's a problem that in, in some respects uh, extends beyond the problem of uh, disclosure of favorable evidence. And that's this, the whole way in which uh, the government deals with uh, cooperating witnesses. And, and um, just run down for us what some of the benefits were that were given to uh, Bill Allen in exchange for his quote-unquote cooperation with the government. So he, he received uh, favorable treatment, of course, in connection with his own sentencing. He was allowed to sell his company for hundreds of millions of dollars. His, uh, there was a theory that his company was involved. His company could have been indicted and could have been put out of business, and he, he uh, was allowed to become uh, very wealthy. He uh, negotiated immunity from, from criminal prosecution for his children. And, and imagine, imagine that as a benefit. And, and, and imagine how many parents in America would, would uh, say something that wasn't true to keep their own children out of jail. I, 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 people shouldn't be put in that position. Um, and then there, there, was there the may whole be thing, more. Well, the whole thing with, the, uh, with, this, with his, uh, the sexual predator stuff, uh, right? That was yeah, a, yeah, well. So. Uh, Yes, I mean, certainly, uh, it is. It, it's it's uncl I don't think Mr. Shulky found that that was a benefit given to him, but it is a fact that he was never prosecuted At for, least a, for any sexual for any or sexual for, or for the suborning of uh, potentially for, for the suborning that, that is, of perjury. That is certainly a fact. He was never prosecuted for that. Yes. Uh, so y y one has to wonder, uh, you know, whether this is a, whether we have a, a sort of a systemic problem uh, with the. the conferring these kinds of benefits in exchange for testimony. Look, it's been done for a long time. You know, you and I know that if we did that as defense lawyers, we'd be disbarred and sent to jail ourselves. We can't give <laughs> benefits to witnesses like that. The government can. They can do it with immunity. My uh, partner, Brennan Sullivan, calls it uh, sanctioned bribery and, uh, and says uh, uh, these benefits are the coin of the realm by which the government buys the, the, the testimony it likes. We, we can't do that. And we may not solve that in this round of reform, but what, but what we can do is make sure the defense gets the information well, see, they this need. Is, this is the thing. The, the one protection, I mean, assuming that this is a, a legitimate government tactic to, to enter into these kinds of agreements, isn't, it, isn't the one protection that the accused have against the wrongful accusation that the, that, that the, the records of what these witnesses are saying are complete, thorough, and available to the defense particularly if there's any inconsistency. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that seems to be the heart of what really, when you get to the, to the key issue in this case, that's what was kept from the defense. That, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that, that was, that's what we knew about even before the Shulky report, the inconsistent well, statements that, that, were, uh, that were kept from us. We didn't know everything about it. We didn't know it was only created eight days before trial. Well, But we, uh, we that, that, that is the essence of it. Yeah. Well, I, I'd like to uh, maybe invite you back at some point for a, uh, a more in-depth discussion about the use of, uh, of cooperators and its effect on the truth-finding function. But I, I'd like to just ask you um, if we can uh, wrap this up um, by telling the viewers what it was uh, that Senator Stevens said uh, to the court 
when the charges were finally dismissed. Now let me paraphrase and then I'll, I'll read it. I, I, guess exactly, I, I, well, I know I, it. No, I know it well I, because I remember it very well. On the day the case was dismissed, uh, Senator Stevens uh, said, said many things. And one is that he had kind of lost his faith in the system throughout this process, but that Judge Sullivan, because he was courageous, uh, had, had restored it. And, uh, but what he also said is that when the dust settles, he wanted to participate in advocacy for legislation that would make it less likely that what happened to him happened to others. And he was waiting for this report to come out, and sadly, he did not make it. And uh, I, I consider it my duty to, to fight on in his name and to try to make uh, what he wanted to happen a reality, to make it less likely that what happened to him will happen to others. Well, I, I want to thank you, uh, Rob, for the, for the work that you've done on this case and for spending the time with us. Um, we didn't have the slide, but I would like to share the exact words of what Senator Stevens said. When the dust settles, uh, and you got it pretty close, by the way, Rob, pretty close. Uh, when the dust settles, I may be able to encourage enactment of legislation to reform the laws related to the responsibilities and duties of those entrusted with the solemn task of enforcing the criminal law. And I, I guess speaking for NACDL, uh, we'd like to think uh, that Senator Stevens uh, would be supporting the Fairness, uh, Fairness uh, in Disclosure of Evidence Act uh, as something that's good for justice and good for this country. Uh, again, I thank you all for joining us. Um, and I encourage uh, anybody uh, who's interested in these issues uh, to uh, continually be able to access updates uh, on our website, uh, it's up on the screen. Uh, we have a special page, uh, a home page for Discovery Reform, www.nacdl.org slash Discovery Reform. Um, thank you very much.